not one to say this uh, lightly. I just, in preparing for this, I felt a very strong anointing. And uh, uh, of the many scriptures in the Word of God concerning healing, uh, it's evident that it's God's will for us to be healed, for His people to be healed. And very often what uh, is found, what I have found, and it's not necessarily the case, if I was to put it in percentages, I would say that uh, in, in our ministry anyway, that probably at least uh, the number of people that we've laid hands on uh, or got under the Word and received the, the healing power of God in their life, I would say probably a good at least 60% of them have retained that healing and walked in it. And uh, what uh, comes up in my, in my heart very often is what about that percentage of people that lose healing, that, that it fails to work, and uh, not fails to work, but maybe they received a touch from God and then it, it, uh, it left their body or left their lives, whatever the case may be. And so I believe the Lord has showed me some things and I want to look at these. In Romans 10, 17, uh, obviously it's a very familiar scripture as it pertains to healing uh, or faith coming for any instance, any situation. But uh, it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Uh, the Amplified Bible says, Faith comes by hearing what is told, is heard comes by the preaching of the message that came from the lips of Christ the Messiah himself. And so we've said over the, over the years that faith for any area, faith for anything comes uh, by hearing the word of God on that subject. Now, just like with anything, faith for that healing comes by hearing the word of God. The faith for keeping that healing comes by hearing the word of God. Because uh, I can be healed, a person can be healed and eventually lose their healing because uh, of a tendency to drift away from the things that I heard. I've said before as it concerns finances, I've talked to people before that were believing God to come out of debt and to be debt free. And, uh, you know, if that's what God laid on their heart, that's... Uh, a wonderful thing, but I've said to them before, it's, it's one thing to have faith to come out of debt, it's another thing to have faith to stay out of debt. Now, uh, I don't necessarily believe that debt's a sin unless the Lord tells you to do it, but the point is, is that getting healed, having faith to be healed is one thing, and then maintaining that faith to stay healed is another thing. And this is evidenced by the Word of God. As faith continues to come, it continues to show up, it continues to be manifest in the area that I need it to be manifest in. Because, and I've said this before, but Brother Hagin said this, he said the two areas that a person has to build their faith consistently in is in the area of healing and the area of finances. Because those are the two areas where we are the most, if I can say it this way, connected to this world system is in my body and in my finances because uh, I'm redeemed, I'm sanctified, you're redeemed, you're sanctified, but I live in a body that's subject to this curse. Uh, in, in other words, one day I will eventually die. If the Lord doesn't return, I'll, I'll cease, the cessation of life will occur. But having said that, that's why I need to consistently build my faith where the area of healing is concerned. Because <clears throat> this body is not so much susceptible like the world is because we're redeemed from the curse, but it is susceptible to those attacks by the enemy. And if I cease or, or stop building my faith where the area of healing is concerned, because I never reach that place where I've just got it. I never reach the place where, okay, I've got this, this area conquered and I don't need to build my faith there any longer. Because that, that disease, that sickness, that flu, that virus, whatever it may be, it's going to attempt to encroach on my rights as a believer. 
And so I've got to consistently build my faith in that area or I can find that I begin to struggle in this area of being well, of being healed, all right? And what you'll find very often is someone will say, well, you know, I don't know what happened. I was healed and, and I was doing well and I don't know what happened. You know, it just, uh, this sickness came back on me or this disease came back on me. And most of the time, now that's not 100% of the time, but most of the time, you can trace that back to they, that person either stopped going into the Word concerning this or uh, they just went away from the things of God altogether. Now, if that happens, then obviously they're, they're wide open to the things of the enemy. I remember one time there was a lady that came to church and we used to have church here on Friday nights, uh, Friday evening. And um, she came and she had cancer. And I remember she came and we had pews at the time. She sat in the very last row back uh, by the wall, the very last row, and uh, uh, the Spirit of the Lord was moving very strongly, and I went back and I prayed for her. And I knew the healing power had went into her body. I knew the healing power of God had flowed. And uh, sure enough, she before she left, she felt better. It was cancer of the lungs is what it was. And she began to feel better before she ever left the service. I mean, she was able to breathe, and, and I saw her a few times after that, and she came to church fairly regular for quite a while, and uh, was doing better and, uh, uh, you know, had even testified that she was healed. And so, praise God, everyone was rejoicing. But then we went through a long period of months. I would say at least six months. I didn't see her at all. I didn't see her in church. I, I didn't see her uh, anywhere where the Word of God was being preached. And one Monday night, we were having a prayer meeting here. And one Monday night, she came in and sat in the very same spot and just looked, looked horrible, looked bad, looked, looked like she was dying. And uh, I went back and uh, I was talking to them and uh, she had her oxygen with her and uh, was barely breathing. And I was talking to her and talking to, I don't remember if the man was her husband or, or some friend, boyfriend, something. And I was talking with them and I'm trying to, to, to locate what do I need to do here because we prayed one time and God instantly touched her body. And it just began to come up in my spirit that that again is what she's wanting. She's wanting this instant touch from God. And as I begin to feel this out, what do I need to do? How do I need to pray? Uh, it just came up real strong in my spirit. There is not faith to be healed there. There's not faith to be healed there. And I hated that. But I, I, I know the voice of the Lord, and you know, He didn't tell me not to pray, so I prayed for her, but I also knew that, that there wasn't faith within her to be healed. And uh, what came to me as I meditated on that was that woman was healed by the power of God. It was evident. It was evident by the way that she looked that Friday night. It was evident by the way that she began to be able to breathe and begin to feel it wasn't just something where she sort of felt better. God had healed her. Her body was whole and well because I'd seen her after that. And what happened is she moved away from the things of God, got out from under the Word of God, and that faith that had started rising in her heart on that Friday night, it was not built sufficiently to, to withstand the attack that the enemy brought at a later date because the the enemy is that way he's he's not just going to stand and let a person declare they're healed without trying to prove that what happened didn't happen and if I'm not consistently receiving the word of God on healing you know it may sound it may seem redundant it may seem uh uh, like it's, you know, I've had people say that's, you know, that's overkill or whatever the case may be. But if a person will, can, even feeling well in my body, I'm not getting healing scriptures always to be healed. I'm listening to them to stay healed because it's producing that medicine in my body. I, uh, there was a book I read one time, part of the book that I read on, on the, the power of the blood uh, by a, a, a minister in Indiana. And it was talking about the healing power of natural blood and how the, the white uh, blood cells and the red blood cells, how they work together 
and uh, the the uh, how the, the white blood cells are like soldiers in our body. Now, I'm, I'm getting to a point. These white blood cells are soldiers in our body, and they attack disease, and, and once they do their job, that that basically they they die in our bloodstream, and then the red blood cells take them over and, and produce more in our body. And what that began to do as I was reading that, and this has been some time ago, was begin to build faith in my spirit about the blood of Jesus because it took the natural blood, how it works, and applied it in the spiritual realm. Now, I wasn't sick in my body. I didn't feel bad in my body, but it produced a strength on the inside of me that I realized that if sickness tries to attack my body, that the blood of Jesus, the Word of God, instantly goes to work and begins to eradicate that out of my system and take it out of my body, whether it's my lungs or a, 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 a virus, cancer, whatever it may be. But if I am not consistently, because faith is to the human spirit, faith is to our reborn human spirit, obviously, what food is to our natural body. And if I, I don't just eat one day a week, all right, I eat on a regular basis because if I don't, then there begins to be a failure of my natural body. My strength will begin to fade. My, my thinking will begin to cloud up. And I've, so I need to eat something on a regular daily basis. So then where faith is concerned for healing, I need to be recharging my spirit at, at, least, at least weekly. I need to be declaring what God said about me and quoting that over my body and putting that in my spirit because healing can be lost. And uh, it's not that that person wasn't healed. It's not that God didn't do what he said he would do. It's that I did not, if I lose my healing, I did not do what was necessary, what was, what was sufficiently necessary to keep that flow in my spirit. Uh, Brother Hagen said he was in a meeting in, in New Mexico and uh, he went there and there was a lady there that had come and, and uh, she had, this was in the, uh, if I remember correctly, in the Voice of Healing Days and uh, <clears throat> she had been to one of Brother Robert's meetings when he was there and she had gotten healed, a miraculous healing. And, but she, this sickness had come back on her and she told Brother Hagen, I, I would like you to pray for me that, you know, I'll be healed again. And he said, uh, he thought about it and he said, Sister, here's what you need to do. He said, we're going to be here. Uh, he, his meetings ran a week at a time. And he taught on faith in the mornings. And then uh, faith and prayer in the mornings. And then in the evening, he would lay hands on the sick and, and do these different things. And he said, you just need to come to every one of these morning sessions and just... Don't get hands laid on you. You just need to come to every one of these morning sessions and build your faith. Well, you know, she obviously probably didn't understand all of that, but uh, she started coming to every one of those morning sessions and just coming to every morning session and being there, hearing the word, you know, hour, two hours, however long he would minister. And uh, come the end of that meeting, uh, it was time he's going to lay hands on the sick. And uh, this lady was there. And uh, she came up to him and she said, oh, Brother Hagin, she said, I don't need you to lay hands on me. She said, the Lord's healed me. You know, just coming every day and staying in the Word. And then he was able to teach her. Then he was able to say, now you see what the Word of God did for you. Just being under the Word. Now go and don't get out from under the Word of God. Keep that Word flowing in your spirit. And so for us here in the, in the sanctuary, those watching online... The important thing about putting the Word of God in my, in my spirit concerning healing, concerning being redeemed from the curse, uh, that's not just something that I see once. And then, thank God, praise God, I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. That's something that, that I feed on on a regular basis because then anything that comes into my life that's associated with the curse of the law. Immediately, my spirit brings up Galatians 3.13 that Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law, having been made a curse for me. And that's part of making sure that the healing that I found, I don't lose. 
making sure that what I produced in my life through the Word of God that I don't lose. And but because that's always a question. I had a minister ask me one time. He said, why do people lose their healing? And uh, to many, it's too simplistic of an answer just to say, well, they didn't maintain what they had received from God. But, you know, I liken it to this, that uh, when you move into a, a new house, a new home, maybe you had your home built or whatever the case may be, you move into a new home, everything's new. Everything is brand new. The carpet's new. The, the counters are new. The walls, the paint is new. Everything's fresh. Everything is, it's never been lived in before. It's brand new. And so what then inevitably begins to happen is that I begin to wear a pathway from the bedroom to the kitchen to the living room to the den, <clears throat> excuse me, whatever it may be. And now if I don't take a vacuum and regularly maintain that carpet, then all of that dirt, all of that, you know, all that that we track in from the outside gets embedded in that carpet and then it, it, it just makes a build up. And before you know it, you know, we've got the carpets matted and, and uh, you know, it's, it looks dark and it looks dingy, but it was brand new. You know, so what I've got to do then is not only vacuum it, but, you know, maybe once a year, a couple times a year, I need to hire somebody to come clean my carpets and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, clean them with solution and, and help keep the thing in that state of newness. It's, it's maintenance on my home. And while it may sound simple, uh, you know, you can go into somebody's home and see their carpet and you think, oh my, this is, this is wonderful, this is beautiful. And they'll say, oh, that, that, that carpet's a few years old. But it doesn't look a few years old because they've maintained it, they've kept it nice, they've worked on keeping that where it needs to be. And, but then you can walk into somebody else's house after just a year of living there. And it looks just like, oh my goodness, <clears throat> they haven't maintained the house, they haven't maintained the walls, they haven't maintained the carpet, they haven't maintained the furniture, and consequently that house looks much older than it should because there has not been any maintenance. Because that house is not going to maintain itself. It's not self-maintenance. And so when I receive the healing power of God in my body, I need to understand that Yes, it worked. Yes, it occurred. Yes, it happened. But there is this maintenance that I have to do to maintain what was done in my life. Hallelujah. I remember growing up, I had a, a good friend of mine that lived right next door to us when, where we lived in Florida. And uh, they, uh, uh, they, were, they were good people, but my, uh, my father had had this house that we were living in built for my mother. And it, I mean, it, now it wasn't a, a grand house. It was just, it was a ranch style home. Uh, we had yeah, three bedrooms, bedroom for my mom, dad, and my sister. I can still see that house in my mind. You kind of walked in, you walked right into the living room and then it was there in the, in the kitchen. Then off to the right was the washroom and my mom and dad's room. Then my sister's room, bathroom, or bathroom, my sister's room, and then my room. Typical 1970s house, 1970s colors. I mean, just, you know, Lots of flowers and yellows and burnt oranges, you know. And uh, I think the house was even yellow. But uh, <laughs> in any event, uh, you know, my father traveled. My mom was home all the time. And so our house was always maintained. I mean, mom took care of it and, and uh, hired somebody, if I remember correctly, to mow the yard or the neighbor mowed it for us or something. I don't remember. But this family moved in next to us. Now, all the houses were the same. I mean, the floor plan on the houses was basically the same. And, uh, uh, but my mom insisted that we keep our house nice. I mean, you, you were not allowed to just leave trash on the carport. You had to pick it up uh, because, you know, we don't want to make the neighborhood look bad. We don't want our house to look bad. God bless us with this house. And uh, the person to the right of us, they, over here, they kept their house nice. But then this other family moved in. And... Uh, it was evident from probably the first week they were not going to keep their house nice. It was, I mean, the trash was in the yard and, 
and it wasn't long that the dad was parking his car in the yard and then he'd have a truck in the yard and, and then they started doing things to the house and they were always starting projects and not finishing them. Their house was, in reality, it was a, it was a few months newer than ours. But when you went into the inside or stood on the outside, you would think that that house was 10 or 15 years older than ours. I mean, there were, you know, they, they, had, they had broken down the carport. I mean, it just, just the things around it. And, uh, you know, people would always come over and they would, they would, well, who lives there? You know, they wanted to know who lived in the junkie house. And uh, it was the same house as ours. It was the same floor plan. It was a little different color. But when you went in, you know, the carpet was dirty. The, the walls were dirty. And it was just a simple issue of maintenance. Now, that same person will say, oh, how I dislike this house. But they dislike that house or they dislike that, that vehicle that they have or whatever the case may be because of a lack of maintenance. And so what people will say was, well, I don't understand. If I was healed, why did I lose it? Well, it's not an issue of were you healed. Yes, you were healed. It's an issue of did you maintain it? Did you consistently maintain what God had given you? Now, another very familiar scripture in Hebrews chapter 2 concerning this is where the Apostle Paul, who I, I believe wrote the book of Hebrews, and he says in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1, and he says in the Amplified Bible, since all this is true, in other words, all that is said about Jesus in chapter 1, since all this is true, we ought to pay much closer attention than ever to the truths we have heard, lest in any way we drift past them and slip away. The King James says, let them slip, lest we drift past them and let them slip away. So, it's not an intentional thing. It's not something where someone intentionally sets about to lose healing. It's more of it slipped away. It slipped through my hands. It slipped through my grasp, uh, whatever it may be. Now, I'm old enough to remember when at all the grocery stores, uh, you had paper bags. They didn't ask you paper or plastic. You got paper. That's what you got. And, uh, and, and obviously, those watching online, some here, you, you remember that too. And so, you know, uh, nowadays you got the plastic bags and they got the handles so you can, you know, you can get three or four bags in one hand and, and pretty much carry most of your groceries in at once. But back years ago, you had these paper bags and you couldn't just grab them, you had to carry them. And it was much easier for them to slip. So if you put too many bags in your hands, you could slip. Drop one out of your hands and, and you'd say, well, it just slipped through my arms. In other words, I didn't have a good enough grasp on this to hold on to it. The word of God, unless I let it slip, it will continue to work and consistently produce in my life because it is a seed. And the Bible lets us know that the seed is designed to produce perpetually as long as I maintain the seed, as long as I am uh, watering the seed and taking care of the seed and getting the weeds out of the seed bed and keeping this thing where it needs to be. Because he said, when he said we should give the more earnest heed, that's the most, the pay more close attention to it. Put my eyes on it on a consistent basis because I don't want to lose what God has given me as far as my healing is concerned. Hallelujah. Now, a lot of this has to do, and uh, a lot of this has to do with me drawing near to God because when I get in the Word of God, it has to do with me drawing near to Him. And in James 4, verse 8, he said in this scripture, James said, that 
if we would draw near to God, James chapter 4, verse 8, he said, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The Amplified Bible says, come close to God and he will come close to you. So the closer I get to God, when I'm drawing near to God, it produces the power of God in my life. The closer I get to God, the closer I get to the power of God. And I cannot really get any closer to God than, than drawing near to His Word. Drawing close to His Word. And uh, I was actually, I was talking to Mario about this this morning before we got going in the office. And I was telling him, I was sharing with him that one of the things that if I could get people to understand is that when I, when I am drawing near to God and I'm drawing close to God, I'm coming closer to what He wants for my life. And so what happens very often is that people want to come to church and get a touch from God and get God to touch their body and touch their lives and, and heal them and set them free. But they, they don't want this continual closeness with, with the Lord. And what that will do is that that will eventually cause healing to begin to, to, to wane in my life. It will cause it to begin to, to uh, be less and less in my life to the point that I can lose what God had placed in my life because of a lack of consistently, continually drawing near to Him. Uh, the, the Bible tells us in Chronicles concerning uh, Asa, King Asa, First uh, Kings, when it talks about Asa, it just simply says that he became sick, diseased in his feet, and that he died. Now, I don't necessarily know that disease. I've, I've had people say different things. Some people thought it was diabetes or whatever. I don't know. But here's what I know. In uh, First Chronicles, it says that what happened to Asa was because that he sought the physicians and not God that he died. And I've heard people say, see, you shouldn't go to the doctor. That's not the point. The point is, is that the Bible says that Asa's heart, in 1 Kings, it says that his heart was perfect before God. He loved God with all of his heart. He cared for God. But when this disease came on him, instead of drawing near to God, he went to man's wisdom. And it wasn't that it was wrong to go to the doctor. It says the reason why that happened to him was he did not seek God. He only put his, his trust in what the physician could do, not in God. And so at that point, God was powerless to help him. It's, it's like this. If, uh, if you're in this room where these lights are on and you're, it's bright, you can see the Bible clearly, you can see the notes clearly, but if you go outside of this room and the room is dark in the next room where you go into, you're going to get some of this light. But you're not going to get it like you would if you drew near to this room. And so you might struggle to read or you might struggle to see. Even though there's lots of power in here to make it readily available. But if I'm farther away from the light source the harder it's going to be to see. And I can be in the darkness saying, well, I know God wants me to see. I know God wants me to read my Bible. I know that, right, there's plenty of light, you know, in there. Yes, there is, but I've got to draw near to it. And so what people will say is, well, I know God can heal. I know God can. I know He's got the power. But why, why am I not healed? Or, or why have I lost my healing? Well, is it possible that they, they, they drew away from the power of God? Because the thing that I've learned is that what produced the results in the beginning is what's going to continue to produce the results long term. What produced the results in the beginning are what's going to continue to produce the results long term. And so... When James says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you, 
when, when God draws near to us, He brings everything that He is with Him. All of His, his healing power, all of His redemptive work, all of His ability to change our life, He brings that with Him. And so He said, when I draw near to Him, that He draws near to me. But that is an action that I have to take. I have to do the drawing near. I have to do the coming, the coming closer. Uh, Brother Keith Moore was talking one time about uh, healing school. He, was, he, he worked with, uh, in healing school for a number of years. He said there was a man there that had a terminal disease. I don't, I don't know the disease. He didn't mention it. But he said uh, that this man was coming. And he said, we just couldn't seem to get, uh, get anything flowing for him. I just, I, he wasn't receiving and so he said, you know, I took some time and, and uh, fasted some meals and prayed and sought the Lord about this. And uh, he said, the Lord finally spoke to me and said, he only wants to get close enough to me to get healed. He doesn't want to consistently let me be Lord of his life. You know, and, that, and that's dangerous because that's what Jesus ran into because he was talking to the, the people of his day, and he was specifically talking about the, the, the religious leaders. And he said, this people, he said, well, did Isaiah the prophet talk about you? And he said, this people draw near to me with their, their mouths, but their heart is far from me. You know, now that over the years has been used in the context of sin, Somebody doesn't want to live for God. You know, they, 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 uh, uh, they want God to bless them, but they don't want to live for God. They're, they're living in sin. Their heart's far from God. Well, my heart can be far from God and not necessarily be living in sin. But my heart can still be far from God. Because I know a lot of, of people that are good people. They might be carnal Christians, but they're good people. I mean, they are. They're good people. They, they wouldn't necessarily lie to you or cheat you or... Uh, they probably don't cuss or drink or, or, or chew or run around with them that do. You know, I mean, <laughs> however you want to say it. But in reality, God's not first. You know, God's not number one. And uh, that causes a problem because God is smart enough to know if I'm just coming to him for something. And not, just, and not coming to him because I want to be with you. You know, Jesus said uh, when he fed the, uh, the multitudes with the loaves and fishes, the very next morning he crossed over the, the sea and it says that the, the disciples looked up and saw the people coming. And they said, Master, look at all these people. And here's what Jesus said. He said, they're coming after the loaves and the fishes, not me. So even Jesus realized that. And you know, he fed those people anyway. Because that's the kind of God we serve. He, he knew what they were coming after and he met their physical needs anyway. Because he's, he's, but the point is, is I wonder how many of those people were in those groups that when Jesus had to say something hard or Jesus had to say something very pointed, they went away and didn't follow him anymore. You know, that, 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 that speaks to me. And so anyway, he said, you know, this man had a terminal disease. And he said, you know, God hates terminal diseases. And we know he does. You know, I mean, if you've ever seen anyone with a terminal disease, it's a horrible thing. God wants to heal everybody. But here, here's the point. If I don't put myself in a position to draw near to him, to draw near to the power of God, all right, I'm going to put myself in a position of not being close to the power of God. And... It's always the heart issue. It always comes down to the heart issue. What is my heart issue? And so back to that original point, that there are a lot of people, they want God to heal them. They want God to touch their body. They want God to rectify some things in their life without really surrendering everything to Him. And that will never produce the power of God long term in my life because I will eventually get to that point of what I call surrender to the things of God. 
where God is asking me, okay, I want you to surrender this to me. And, and God will never say, he will never say, you know, after I healed your body and after all I did for you and I saved you, you were sorry and no good and I saved you anyway. The least you could do is live for me. He'll never do that. And we know that because we know our Father. But he heals me to show me his goodness. And when I draw nearer to him and I'm coming into his presence just because I want to be with him, then all those things that he is, they, they follow him. And, uh, you know, the, the end result of that story was, was that the man didn't get healed, and I don't like that. But, you know, I'm, I'm learning something. And thank God we never get too old to learn and we never know it all. <laughs> Amen. But I'm, I'm learning something. That the more I just go into the presence of God and say, Lord, what do you want to talk about? The more he reveals things to me, the more he shows me things. You know, because I used to kind of have an agenda when I went into the presence of God. Now, I need to pray about this, and I need to pray about this, and I need to pray about this. And, and me and the Lord, we need to talk about this. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't ever have a, a plan to go in and, and, and pray. But it, it turned into something where, <clears throat> and I was sharing this with, with Mario this morning as well, it turned into something where it was almost, I, I'll hear people a lot, and they go to God, and they're, and they're telling God everything that's wrong. And God knows everything that's wrong. He knows what we need. That's what Jesus said. He said, don't be seeking after all these things that the Gentiles are seeking after because your Heavenly Father knows you have need of them. He said, seek the kingdom and His way of doing and being right, and all these things would be added to you. And so, having said that, you know, very often people will approach God, well, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm sick, I have this disease, I have this, and I've got this going on, I've got this going on, I've got that going on. And God knows that. When more often than not, He just wants us to come into His presence and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? I just need to know what to do. Just tell me what to do, and I'll do What do you think about this? You know, and what begins to happen is that then God can begin to, to move because, I see, I'm drawing near to Him. And God can begin to move in my life and produce these results in my life and I won't lose them because I'm consistently drawing near to Him. I'm consistently drawing near to Him. Uh, if I can tell you another story, there was a minister one time that worked with Brother Hagin and he was uh, uh, had not been on the road with them very much. And, and uh, so finally, the day come, they, he started traveling with him, and they were in the back, and they were praying. And, and the, man, the minister said, I thought, oh, this is great. He said, this is my time to, to get to ask questions and get all my questions answered. I'll be praying with Brother Hagin before the service. And he said, you know, finally, he, he, one of those services, he ventured a question. He said, Brother Hagin, he said, what about this and this and this and, and this? And he said, Brother Hagin just kind of looked at him and said, yeah, okay, mm-hmm. And uh, then just didn't say nothing. And he said, you know, two minutes of silence can seem really long. <laughs> and he, he said, finally, Brother Hagin said, all right. And he, he had Rama singers and band there. And, and he said, all right. He said, uh, y'all going out and get service started. He said, work up a good one. And he said, so we went to the next service and and the same thing happened. I said, Brother Hagin, what about this and this and this? And he said, uh, yeah, okay, mm-hmm. All right, y'all go get service started and work up a good one. And he said, finally, I went to the Lord about this. And I said, Lord, what's wrong here? Because, you know, he's not saying anything to me. Am I, am, what am I doing wrong? And he said, the Lord said to him, he said, at that time, Brother Hagin had been in the ministry over 40 years. And the Lord said to him, he said, this man has been in the ministry over 40 years. He's received multiple visitations from the head of the church. And he said, and yet, when you get with him, you're only concerned about what you're thinking. He said, shouldn't you be concerned with what he's thinking? And the Lord helped him to see through that, that very often what happens 
is people get into the presence of God and they're only concerned with telling God what they think, with what they feel, with how they're doing, with what's going on in their life. And the problem is that God already knows that. And if I draw near to Him, if I draw near to Him and I say, Lord, what do you think about this? Then He can give me those answers. Now, the Lord showed me this is how healing can be lost as well. Drawing near to God produces it. It can be produced in my life by just drawing near to God. The more I spend time not drawing near to Him, drawing, moving away, if you will, then that healing can be lost because I'm getting farther and farther and farther away from the source. The Lord showed it to me in this, with this example of, of like a, 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 a Wi-Fi stream. Now, obviously, you can get different bandwidths and different things. But, uh, you know, I could take my uh, computer or my phone uh, outside of our church and, and I could go to the end of either one of the parking lots. And if I put in the Wi-Fi search, it would pull up our, our Wi-Fi name. It may not have as many bars as right here in the church, but it would pull up our Wi-Fi name because those, those Wi-Fi signals... They're going out the, the, the walls, I mean, uh, for whatever circumference that it is. But here's the point. The closer I get to the building, the more bars I get. Right? And the, and the more ability that I have. If I'm back here on the back side of the parking lot and I've got one bar, now obviously I, I, I know the, the passwords and whatnot, so, but I've got one bar, and the printer and, and everything, that, that it's all Wi-Fi enabled. And so I've got one bar and I've got a big document to print. I can hit print from now till next week. And the, the bandwidth is just not sufficient to print from the back of the parking lot. There's just not enough power. Why? Because right here in the middle of this church, right here in the office... That there are five bars of power. And there's no problem. Anybody getting anything done, they need to get done. But the farther I move away from that modem, the farther I move away from that router, the less power I get, even though, even though I have access to it. And the Lord, the Lord said to me, the farther someone moves away from what worked in the beginning, then... The, the less power they have. And, and, and they, might even, they might even be standing there and they can feel the presence of God and, 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 and they even experience it, but there's just not enough to overcome that problem that they're facing. Because as they drew near to God, they got stronger. They got stronger and stronger and stronger because they were coming into a more close proximity to the power of God. That's so, that's so, that is so vital to maintaining healing, to maintaining this vitality that God wants us to walk in and to manifest. Because anybody that I've ever seen, and now, now I'm not talking about facing a battle or, or having a, 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 a bit of a, if we can use the word struggle, I mean, uh, like I say, I've, I've had uh, uh, issues in my own life where, you know, I'm believing God for this and I see the breakthrough and I see the victory. And then a month later, the same thing tries to, to come back in my life. Well, I mean, the enemy's always going to try to do that. But so that's not what I'm talking about. What I mean is that when I start regressing all the way back, to how it was in the very beginning, then that's evidence to me that I've moved away from the power. Because the Bible says that God not only has the power to, to save us, but it says He'll keep us. That's powerful to me. Because that means He not only has the power to heal me, keep me healed. Or to bless me, but to keep me blessed. Amen. 
And so I've got to make sure that my spiritual bandwidth is where it needs to be, is as strong as it needs to be. Maybe, and there's times uh, I need to go to God, maybe just get another download. You know, just download the latest software, whatever it may be, you know. But uh, the point is, is, and not to be legalistic, you know, that, that's not the point. But what I see sometimes in the church age that we live in is less of this teaching people of the necessity of being close to God. And I see more and more where people are just being taught that's not really necessary, you know, because God understands. Well, God does understand that we're human. And I, I mean, thank God that he does. But at the same time, he says, Philip, draw near to me. And I'll draw near to you. And, and in my mind, that's what set apart. Very often people talk about the ministers of, of the last generation and the ministers of this generation. And why don't we see this? And why don't we see that? Well, I'm not judging anybody. That's not my place. But I will say they will look at this generation, the, the Oral Roberts and the Kenneth Hagins and the John Osteens and these different ministers. And they'll say, what was the difference between them and and X, Y, Z. And the thing that I can see, the thing that, that I believe is the biggest thing, is that generation knew how to draw close to God. That's the biggest thing that I see. And it wasn't that some of them weren't even the greatest ministers or the greatest orators, but they knew how to draw close to God and to keep what God had given them. And that's what the Bible says, and, it, and, and I'll start wrapping this up, but that's what the Bible says that, that I love because it says that he's able to keep that that he entrusted to us. He's able to keep that function in in our lives. And so in all, in all truthfulness, there's no reason for a person to lose healing if they'll just follow those simple steps. Consistently building faith in the healing that they've received. Uh, not allowing it to slip. And the enemy, the enemy has different uh, ways of trying to help what we receive slip from us. And then thirdly, just drawing near to God. Drawing near and bringing myself closer to that power source on a regular basis. Hallelujah. It will cause great victories in our lives. And so before we go, I do want to pray for uh, all of us, those watching online, those of us here in the sanctuary, because, hallelujah, the power of God, the power of God, really, actually, when I was coming back from New Orleans, I was telling them last night uh, in Bible school, FBIMA, uh, the Lord was, was talking to me about some things, and uh, I got on the plane, and, and the, the airline that I fly, they don't have... Uh, uh, pre prescribed seating. I mean, it's, it's first come, first serve, depending on your boarding group. And I'm, I'm not the kind of person that minds sitting between people. I'm really affable. I mean, obviously, you know, I'm a pastor. But uh, so I don't mind. And, and uh, uh, so usually I'll, I'll, I'll get him, I'll take the first seat that's available the closest to the front, which sometimes is a middle seat. And uh, I got there and, and it was nighttime, it was dark. And, and uh, I sat down and I had my, my podcast had some things going, but I was listening to a certain song. And long story short, and it's just, it's been that since Sunday, this would have been Sunday evening, around 6.37. And the plane was getting ready to take off, and I was sitting there, and the lady over here, she was doing something on reading a magazine. I think I had her light on reading a magazine. And the guy over here, he was already sleeping. Uh, we were taking off, he was sleeping. And uh, we got up in the air and had kind of leveled off. And in that plane, just in that plane... The Holy Spirit just, he just came all over me. And I was sitting there between these two people. And I, it, was, it wasn't uncomfortable. I was loving it. But I thought, dear God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick this person, you know, or something. But it, <laughs> glory to God, it was this anointing that just came on me. And it just stayed there. And 
uh, the, of course, the Lord began to talk to me about some things, the next step, the things that he wants us to do, and began to tell me where we want to plan our next church and the state that we want to go to. He even gave me a city name, so we're working on that. But the point is, is I felt this anointing, and when I got up this morning, that same anointing was still there. And then when I was sitting in the office before I came out here for healing school, that anointing was just there. And uh, so I know, I know by the power of the Holy Spirit that as we pray, uh, our bodies are going to be touched. Even those who, even those watching online, I just, I, I perceive that in my spirit in the name of Jesus. Father, I just, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, more than just pray, I just come into your presence and Lord, I command health. I command health into the bodies of those listening, those present here in this room. Father, those watching online, Lord, even I know that anointing, this anointing can be transferred onto the, the CD and the podcast, Lord, of this message. Father, I just demand healing in their bodies. Lord, your word says that the anointing is what removes the burdens and destroys the yoke. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that just like you said in the book of Isaiah, that in that day, and I declare that this, that day is this day, that in that day, that the yoke would be removed from off of their neck by reason of the anointing. And Father, I just send that anointed word to every person, watching every person under the sound of my voice, and I declare health in your body. I declare healing in your body. I declare every respiratory symptom to clear up in the name of Jesus. Sinus infections. Father, I see that. That cancer of the bloodstream. Lord, we come against that in the name of Jesus. We declare you null and void and harmless in the name of Jesus. Kidney infections. Lord, we just speak the healing power of God to go into that bloodstream, to go into those vessels and purify and clean and clear up and make well in the name of Jesus. Father, I just declare by the power of the name of Jesus that each person hearing or watching, Lord, that they are divinely healed right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Lord, I thank you for that in the name of Jesus. I thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, the Lord says, the Lord says respect. Respect is going to begin to come to you from different avenues and different areas, even areas that it has never come to you before. <laughs> the wisdom and the knowledge on your life, the Lord says, people are going to begin to recognize it. It's even wisdom. Oh, sister, it's even wisdom. It's even wisdom that you don't know you possess. But the Lord says, just like I was able to use you to talk to that young man that was taking you to the airport and to lead him to me, I'm going to put my words in your mouth. I'm going to put my wisdom in your spirit. And you're going to speak to people. And it's going, it's going to be like the spirit that came on Jesus as he stood in the synagogue and conferred with the leaders. They were amazed at the wisdom that came out of his mouth. And you're not going to have to work it up. You're not, you're not going to have to conjure it up. It's just going to be there. And it will come to pass what I said, the Lord says. It will come to pass what I said, that in that day, you won't have to wonder about what you're going to say. But the Holy Spirit will give you words. The Holy Spirit will give you words. Because 2015 will indeed be for you a year of expansion, multiplication, and increase. Hallelujah. Father, I, I glorify you for that. Lord, thank you for healing your people. Thank you for speaking to us. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Praise God. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus.